Uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Ramanujan. I'm always happy to visit Warwick, even if uh, virtually only. Uh, if uh, some of you turn on the uh, cameras, I appreciate of having some faces I, I, I can see, but... Um, uh, so um, this is joint work with uh, Daniel Dadush from CWI and Bento Natura, my uh, uh, PhD student at LSC and uh, Bento uh, helped me with uh, most of the slides as well. So I'm going to talk about how we can uh, turn fast approximate algorithms into exact algorithms for linear programming and what I exactly mean by that. So linear programming is uh, all of us are familiar with is probably the most fundamental problem in optimization. This is the standard equality form I'm going to use. Uh, n will always be the number of variables and m will be the number of equality constraints. So we have ax equals b, x and negative, and we want to minimize uh, c times x. So well, this problem, of course, has a very uh, long and uh, distinguished history, uh, starting um, in the 19th century, the, the uh, probably biggest single development was the uh, simplex method. Uh, and then in the 70s and the 80s, we had two very influential algorithms, uh, the ellipsoid and interior point methods that provided the first polynomial time algorithms um, for uh, this problem. But uh, what still remains open, which is uh, um, kind of the holy grail in this area is to find a strongly polynomial algorithm for linear programming. And I'm not going to give that to you today, but uh, some small step in that direction. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, remind ourselves what this uh, weakly and strongly polynomial mean. Uh, so we have again an LP with n variables, m constraints, and let L be the uh, total bit complexity of the input. So if we write down all the entries in the matrix, all entries in the right-hand side vector B and cost function C uh, in binary, we, that requires together L bits. So, well, a weakly polynomial algorithm would be polynomial in the description of the input, which of course includes this L. Um, so that's, kind of the standard notion of a polynomial time algorithm. Whereas in a strongly polynomial algorithm, we want to remove the most crucial dependence on M, L. We want the number of basic arithmetic operations, which is like addition, multiplication, uh, and uh, divisions and uh, comparisons. We want to bound them just in terms of the variables and the constraints. And uh, we also, of course, multiplying two big numbers takes time. We, and we want to make sure the input size doesn't blow up. So we do require uh, the algorithm to be in polynomial space. Uh, now, uh, let me first talk about what has been going on regarding weekly polynomial algorithms recently. It's uh, some very uh, exciting developments and very strong results. So first of all, I'm, let me not give these results for the bit complexity dependence L, which is not the uh, best form to write these, but in terms of approximate Solver. So what these algorithms I'll mention can give us is uh, for any positive epsilon, we can get an epsilon approximate solution, which will be close in objective value to the optimum. Here I have the norm of the uh, cost function and R, which is like a, a, a bound on the uh, norm of the uh, optimal solutions. And then I also 
well, I'm not exactly feasible, but I'm approximately feasible. So the A x equals B constraints can also have some little violation. Now, the dependence on epsilon in the running times is on log of one over epsilon. Um, for small enough epsilon, we can convert it these into exact algorithms, but with dependence on L, uh, the bit complexity. However, epsilon like, uh, is, is probably a better uh, measure here. And these conversion to exact does uh, come with some tedious details. Now, um, in recent years, uh, there, there were a couple of breakthrough results here, first by Lee and Sitford, who gave this algorithm whose dependent running time depends on this NNZ of A is the number of uh, non zero entries in the constraint matrix A plus M square. So recall M is the smaller one, the, the, the rank of the, the matrix times, and this is the very interesting term that the square root uh, of M uh, improving from the, 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 the long-standing square root of n dependence in, in this context. Um, and then, so I'll tell you just very few words what these algorithms are about, but the, the, they are all like improved versions of interior point methods. Um, then Cohen Lee and Sitford gave an algorithm which is, well, ignoring log factors is in a, uh, n to the omega, which omega is 2.37, the, the matrix multiplication uh, constant. Uh, very recently, Van den Brand improved this algorithm. So the previous words, uh, ones involve some randomness. And uh, now that the, currently we can already do it in n to the omega in deterministic time. And very recently in uh, stock this year, uh, there was an improvement which uh, uh, can be much better if M, the rank of the system is much smaller than N, then we can go from N to the uh, 2.37 to M N plus M cube, which could be uh, much better. So uh, these are, uh, as I said, all improvements of interior point methods. One improvement is conceptual using instead of the, the standard central path uh, weighted and stochastic versions of the central path. Um, what, well, basic steps in interior point methods involve uh, matrix inversions and maintaining inverses. So what these algorithms do, they incredibly speed up these operations using um, fast approximate maintenance of the uh, inverses as they change during the algorithm. And also what the, the most uh, recent developments have been about is just getting better and better use of the cutting edge data structures to, to maintain all this. So um, now this is all stuff I'm not going to talk about. This will be everything I just uh, comfortably keep in a black box and don't want to uh, look at the details. So as I said, my main function, which I've been, uh, main, main focus, which I've been looking at from various directions uh, in the past years is pushing the boundary of what we can compute in strongly polynomial time. Um, so here, the first famous examples were uh, for combinatorial optimization problems for the maximum flow um, problem. The first polynomial algorithm by Edmund Scarp and Dinitz was already weakly polynomial, uh, strongly polynomial conveniently. However, for minimum cost flows, it remained open for a very long time until the uh, breakthrough result by Eva Tardosh in 85. And um, as you will see, what 
we are doing here today is a direct descendant of this Stardash's work. Um, so, well, there are actually some uh, special cases of combinatorial uh, linear programs, which uh, are different from flows where we, we have um, strongly polynomial algorithms all using quite a, a variety of techniques for two variable per inequality systems uh, for um, discounted Markov decision processes and uh, also uh, for the maximum uh, generalized flow problem. But uh, putting these cases aside, now I'll focus on what kind of uh, is a, a main stream direction here is um, how much, if we look at this system, minimize C times X subject to AX equals B X non negative, how much can I, uh, wh where can I isolate the bit complexity dependence uh, or, or the dependence on the entry? So it turns out to the, the right way to look at this question is trying to solve linear programs such that the, we only depend on some parameter or description of the constraint matrix, but we do not depend on the uh, right-hand side vector B or the cost function C. So the, the first example here, which is, is uh, sort of the, the, the most important one for us today is another paper by Tardosh, right uh, in a year after the, the Minkos flow paper, which um, realized that the arguments used for, uh, for Minkos flows can go quite a long way. If we have a matrix with integer entries, and the bound delta on the absolute value of the largest square subdeterminant of this integer matrix, then we can um, solve LP in polynomial of MN and log of delta arithmetic operations. So again, the dependence, there's no dependence on B or C, and the, the way we see the matrix is this largest subdeterminant. Now, uh, quite substantial extension happened in by Vavasis and Ye, who in 96 gave a layered least squares interior point method, where uh, the dependence will be on log of chi bar. This is a condition number I'll um, talk a little more about. So the, the, the interesting feature of this algorithm, it does not require any integrality of, of the matrix. It um, introduces this condition number, which uh, um, also makes sense for, for uh, real matrices and shows that the special version of interior point methods with some uh, additional um, combinatorial steps included will uh, terminate in time independent of B and C. And in a recent work, we had the same uh, uh, Daniel Dadush, uh, Bantu Natura, my co authors, and Sophie Huibers is uh, 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 earlier uh, this year, we had a, an improved version of this, which is a, um, a scaling invariant uh, version improving this condition number two, an optimized version of the sky bar, which I'll uh, mention a little later. Um, so yeah, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, Vavasis, yeah, this does uh, extend um, the uh, uh, Tardos result because the sky bar will bound the subdeterminant bound if um, we have an integer constraint matrix. And it's, it's actually a very nice geometrical uh, uh, quantity, which does not depend on the actual matrix, however, but just on the uh, subspace uh, defined as the kernel of this matrix. However, as some uh, disappointing news, 
this is very hard to compute or even approximate this condition number. We cannot get like a two to the poly m uh, approximation uh, according to a result uh, by Tanchal that's already NP hard. So uh, now the, the main question after we obtained this uh, improved layered least squares result and what we, we wanted to understand, first of all, um, yeah, can we, uh, can we make these faster? Can we somehow um, benefit from the improved running time bounds uh, on the weekly polynomial algorithms? And um, uh, so if one would like to extend all these ideas of weighted central path and fast uh, arithmetics, then we would, well, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would be a hundreds of pages paper for sure. Um, so we really didn't feel like doing this. And also another motivation was we wanted to understand like just conceptually this dependence on uh, this condition number chi bar, which is the, the best uh, we currently know how you can isolate the complexity of LP. Is it really because of the um, some magical properties of interior point methods like these layered least squares methods are very different from the, the usual combinatorial arg arguments we have and uh, well the is is it really something which we can only do with these specific algorithms as opposed to Tardosh's original work which was really sort of a black box approach um, taking an arbitrary weakly polynomial LP solver and turning it into strongly polynomial. And it turns out that uh, it can, can be done in this uh, chi bar um, uh, dependence as well. So uh, what I will talk to you uh, today about is a black box approach where we can hide all these super fast approximate LP solvers in a black box and iteratively call them to recover combinatorial information, which will be the, on the support of the optimal uh, solutions. And what I, I, I really like about uh, this and what I'll mainly emphasize is that there are very nice and, uh, and, and clear underlying uh, proximity results on uh, the, the LP solutions. So um, yeah, uh, so let me just uh, tell you first a few words about what was the Stardust's framework, which is really the, uh, the direct extension of what she did for minimum cost flows. So what, so what she did was the following. Let's assume we have an exact uh, solver, uh, which is weakly polynomial, meaning that if I put there B and C, which are small integers bounded in terms of N and Delta, then it gives me the optimal solutions in um, strongly polynomial time or, or in time which uh, is the, of the required dependence. Uh, and well, these, we will see them as sort of perturbed problems of the original problem. And then if we have an optimal solution to this perturbed versions of the problem, then uh, we can conclude that there must be an optimal solution hiding not too far from here. And then what the, the basic idea will be the following. So if we have a close enough, an optimal solution to a close enough rounded or perturbed version of this LP, then for some variable, it will be guaranteed that I have an optimal solution, which is so close to, to my current solution that in some uh, variables, uh, this optimal solution must be positive. And if we conclude this information that, uh, that then 
we well basically if you know that there is an optimal solution which is always positive on the first variable then you can just uh, um, delete this first uh, variable from your system you, you can uh, basically project it out and recurs on a smaller problem now on a very high level we will uh, reproduce this scheme, but there are some quite uh, uh, non-trivial obstacles to overcome. So this is a summary of what we do. Uh, we extend Tadashi's results for the case of uh, arbitrary real matrices and improve to this dependence on this log of chi bar, which I will very soon tell you about what this uh, chi bar really is. And then uh, we will, uh, instead of Tardash's framework that requires exact solutions to rounded systems, we can look at approximate uh, LP solvers, which give us much more flexibility. And we can just directly plug them in. And whenever uh, these smart people improve the linear algebra, we immediately can translate it into an improved uh, strongly polynomial algorithm for the case when uh, the slog chi bar is bounded in terms of M and N. So for example, using this uh, most recent deterministic Van den Brand algorithm, which runs in N to the omega plus uh, times log factors, we have an overhead m times n uh, for optimization and only an overhead m for feasibility to, to get the exact solutions. And one other uh, nice feature of what we uh, do, as I said, this uh, condition numbers are very hard to estimate. And the, the standard way to go about this is to start with a guess and then if I don't get the desired solution, keep increasing this guess, which it's fine. And it's, uh, you know, uh, um, you, you don't even lose in the running time, but what our algorithm even does, it actually uh, gives us certificates in case our guess was wrong. So in, in this sense, we, we really uh, get the, the most out of this. Okay, so uh, are there any questions so far? So let me just say a few words about how we compare to, um, to Tardor. So, well, in both framework for optimization, we will need to call uh, a black box solver M N times. However, well, that the main difference is that for Tardos, you need like these systems given ahead explicitly. Um, and that the main, like, like the, the arguments really like inherently use integrality properties such as, as Kramer's rule uh, for, for integer matrices. So, what kind of a key combinatorial property uh, there is that if you have a basic solution for this integer matrix with subdeterminant A, then in every basic solution, every variable is either zero or it is positive in by some non-trivial amount. And this is kind of a basic property one can um, build on. And if we give up, integrality and uh, just work with these general condition numbers, all, all this, these arguments will vanish. Now, for full disclosure, I wanted to mention that if that the, like even for integer matrices, uh, the sky bar can be uh, much smaller than delta. But in case when it's actually, the, the, these are roughly in the same ballpark, these two condition numbers, then, well, the, the, the two algorithms do give similar running times because also these fast approximate solvers can be plugged into uh, Tardosh's framework, but it does come with lots of extra work, uh, which 
requires expensive computations to round approximate so solutions to integer ones, which would, will not dominate the running time, but is still quite some overhead, whereas we, we use the, the, the solutions uh, directly. Uh, okay, so let me finally tell you a bit about the sky bar um, condition number and why we are so uh, interested in it. So first I just put up here the definition just for purposes of uh, intimidation. So it's defined as um, a supremum of a projection matrix norm over uh, this uh, bold D uh, stands for the uh, diagonal matrices. So uh, uh, this bounds the norm of oblique projections um, uh, for, for a, li uh, a linear space. It, it just depends on the kernel of the matrix. And while it has a long history, uh, the, this measure, it does come up very naturally in numerical linear algebra and specifically for interior point methods. And this turned out to be the key player for, um, for these uh, layered least steps algorithms. But, you know, uh, especially for someone who, who comes from more of a combinatorial background, uh, this is something quite difficult to work with. And what, kind of is, is the most interesting part here. So this is what the, what the, the, the main messages I want to, to do in the talk is to, to spread this notion is uh, what we call the circuit imbalance measure, which is a combinatorial uh, sister of uh, the sky bar measure. Uh, so, um, this uh, is what we also played a key role in our, our previous paper, um, is defined as follows. So take any matrix A, and again, we will be focusing on the linear space defined by the kernel of this matrix. Then we call a subset of columns a circuit if it's a minimal linearly dependent subset of the columns. So this is the same as circuits in the linear matrix. And then, well, what do we have for every circuit? Uh, there is a vector G, uh, which is supported in, in the kernel, which is supported on this circuit. And this, is, this defines a one-dimensional subspace. It's unique up to scaling. That's because of the, the minimality of, of this set of columns. So, so the, the, this G is really the coefficients which make these columns can, cancel out. And then the circuit imbalance measure is that we take all these circuits and for each circuit, we take the ratio between the largest and the smallest element and, and the absolute value of that. And the maximum over all circuits and all elements in the support of the circuits gives you the circuit imbalance measure, which we denote by kappa uh, A. Uh, is this definition clear? So this is again, kind of the key, key definition of the talk. So, so let me repeat again. So we look at all minimal MUM support vectors in the kernel of the matrix A, and we look at the maximum ratios between the absolute values in between two elements. Note that because G is unique up to scaling, well, this ratio is really unique for any fixed circuit. So the first nice observation is how it connects to Delta. So remember, a matrix is a totally unimodular matrix if all square subdeterminants are 0, plus 1, and minus 1. In this case, our kappa will be 1. All minimal linear dependencies in a TU matrix are plus minus 1 vectors, which is like a basic corollary of TU-ness. And moreover, if you have a, 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 an integer matrix with a subdeterminant bound delta, then from Kramer's rule, you see that the, this will be really uh, uh, the delta also bounds kappa. 
And what we noted in the previous paper slightly strengthened in this one, which is actually quite a simple uh, observation that this kappa approximates this uh, mysterious sky bar uh, defined as this projection norm very closely. Well, it's within a factor n, but we live in a world where in the running time dependence, you actually don't not even have log chi bars, but log n plus chi bars. So then if we take the logs, we are really within a constant factor. So I, I stated all the running times with chi bar because that's the standard notion, but actually what we get the results are for this kappa. Now, let me point out that this already for integer matrices, this kappa uh, could be much better than delta. Imagine the incidence matrix of an undirected graph, which has many disjoint uh, triangles, then if we have like n over three disjoint triangles, then uh, well, the determinant for each triangle is two. To, so we will have two to the n over three as the maximum subdeterminant. But uh, kappa will always be just two. You can easily see that whenever you have like a, a minimum linear dependency, you can just get away with um, a half integer solution. So like already, if you have integer matrices, this is a, 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 can, can be a, a huge improvement from the subdeterminant bound. And let me just mention here, which is not strictly needed for our algorithm, but it's, it's kind of very cool from our previous paper. So let, uh, we, we can very nicely optimize these condition numbers, kappa and chi bar, uh, using this combinatorial viewpoint. So let uh, D denote the set of all positive diagonal matrices. Then if we multiply the constraint matrix from the right with D, this is a very natural invariance of the linear program. Um, it also like the central path is invariant under this transformation and standard interior point methods are invariant under this transformation. However, the original uh, layered least square method was not. And in fact, this is uh, what was our main purpose there is to find a, a scaling invariant version because chi bar is also not invariant. You can arbitrarily improve it by rescaling the columns of the matrix. It can get much better. Um, and same for chi bar. And what we can do using some combinatorial insights in strongly polynomial time, we can get a near optimal rescaling of uh, these condition numbers, which I now wrote for chi bar. So, so this near optimal means that I get a rescaling, which is uh, at most n times uh, chi bar star cube. And uh, well, this sounds directly contradicting what I told earlier, this Tunchell's lower bound, and we cannot approximate chi bar within a factor two to the rank of A. So the way we get around this is that you know, know that well, there is this chi bar cube. So, so we kind of chi bar will be part of the approximation factor itself. And uh, so, so that's why it does not contradict Tunchell's result. But for all purposes, this will be a good enough approximation because again, we have a log chi bar dependence which eats up all these factors. So whatever algorithms I uh, talk about today, we can improve the dependence from chi bar to the op this optimized version chi bar star by doing this initial rescaling. All right. Um, so let me now start talking about proximity and uh, what this exactly means and how chi bar is a very natural player here and how this will give us LP algorithms. So the um, first, let me just uh, 
ask you to change your mindset. So the way we normally describe LPs is this uh, form AX equals B, X non-negative minimize C transpose X. Now for all the, our frameworks, a much more convenient view is to look at the subspace W, which is the kernel of A. And then we look at the system minimize C X such that X is in W plus little d and x non-negative. Now, this d is any vector which uh, gives a d equals b. So of course, if you are given a b, you can just solve the system of linear equations know that you don't care about non-negativity. -neg so uh, you can equivalently transfer it for to this form. The reason we are doing it that this d is actually a much more natural thing to work with than uh, B, which is the original right-hand side. So um, it was actually a question, uh, which is a special case for of what Hoffman asked in the 60s. And there has been many applications in, in uh, various areas. If we have a linear program and we have an infeasible point, then how far do we need to go from this point to get a feasible point? And by how far we can, we have basically two spaces and, and can put two norms uh, onto them. So the question we are looking at is our linear feasibility problem, X in W plus D, X non negative. Recall this is the same as AX equals B, X non negative. Then what I'm gonna, uh, show now, and this is actually a proof I will present now, that there always exists a feasible solution such that the infinity norm between x and d, x minus d, uh, the maximum entry absolute value of x minus d will be bounded by this circuit imbalance measure times the sum of the negative entries in the vector D. Why does the sum of negative entries come up here? What happens if this is zero, if D is a non-negative vector? Well, then we can just return X equals D is happily a feasible solution. And well, it's pretty close to D. Uh, the difference has norm zero. And that's what we exactly want, right? So, so what we are trying to force is that if you, um, you really just move away from D by the minimum necessary amount. And this D minus norm is sort of a lower bound how far you need to move. And what the theorem says is that this kappa is, gives you the upper bound on how far you have to go. So uh, proof uh, with these uh, pictures, take any feasible non-negative x uh, in this affine subspace w plus d. Then if we look at the difference vector x minus d, that will be undoubtedly in this linear subspace, the kernel of the matrix. So now, uh, as a corollary of Kara Theodoris theorem, we can always decompose this vector in a sign consistent way uh, into uh, circuits, minimum support solutions in the kernel. So let me show you in the picture. I have the, on the upper picture, the blue bars are uh, D in decreasing orders of coordinates and X is the, the red bars. And uh, so you can see the last three coordinates of D are the negative ones. Now in the, the lower picture, the blue, uh, the green bars represent D minus X. So that's just uh, the, the uh, uh, sorry, X minus D, that's the, uh, uh, the uh, orange minus the blue equals green. And then I decompose this into three support minimal solutions in a sign consistent way, meaning that whenever the X minus D is positive, then all these entries are non-negative uh, and whenever it's negative, they are all uh, non-positive. Um, so as you can see, we have a red one, uh, 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 a purple one and a yellow one. Now, let's first look at what's the deal with this red circuit. 
So this actually does not intersect any of the negative components. So now I could just actually delete this by delete, meaning that I subtract this G1 from X. Then, well, since this was in the, the subspace, the, 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 the subtracted vector is still in the right affine subspace W plus D. Uh, so, uh, so, so I still have a solution, but I've actually decreased, well, not necessarily the infinity norm, but the one norm I certainly decreased because of sign consistency. So the, these red vectors are not there. And then I'm left with the yellow and purple vectors. Now, what I know about all these vectors that they do intersect the support of, uh, uh, of D minus. And um, so for this reason, uh, I can use just the definition of kappa telling me that if I, for example, look at this uh, purple, big purple bar outside the negative coordinates, it will be at most kappa times the smallest one inside, like kappa times uh, this, this penultimate one. And similarly, if for, for the, the yellow, like this big yellow will be bounded by one of these yellow ones. And again, by side consistency, the, the yellow uh, or orange and, and purple add up to the green. Uh, so that's why we can basically say that we can bound everything outside the support of the negative coordinates by um, the sum of the uh, coordinates of x minus uh, d in uh, d minus. Okay, so I mean, I just wanted to give you an impression that really the circuit imbalances very uh, naturally come up in these sort of proximity uh, results. I'll uh, talk a little more about this, but let's just see how this will be used. Now there is a little animation thanks to Bento. So what I'm doing here, I'm getting like better and better approximate LP solutions with positive and negative entries on the left. And then I have this confidence interval, which corresponds to kappa times the sum of the negative entries around the current solutions. So whenever you see some red bars remaining, then you, you are happy because then you know that actually there is a feasible solution which must be positive on all these entries. So, we are almost there, like we, we already have an, a natural algorithm if a bit rudimentary. So what do we do? Let's say we get from an approximate solver a near feasible solution, which, well, it's not quite feasible. It can have some negative entries, but let's say there are just few negative entries. Then I define my set I is where I still have some red bars surviving where um, this zi is uh, greater than kappa times the, the sum of the negative entries, the, the right-hand side, and let j be all the other indices. Um, so proximity tells me that there is a feasible solution which is positive on i. Now I can recurse on the subspace, which I get by projecting out all these variables on i. Um, which if you want to see the linear algebra, I take if W was the kernel of the matrix, then I do a Gaussian elimination of the variables on I and then just delete these unit vector columns and I, I'm left with the, the smaller matrix on the projection. So at the, 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 the simplest level, this is, well, this is our starting algorithmic scheme. Um, now, of course, there are some issues here. First of all, we do need to guarantee that the set i, like we, we need to be able to get a near feasible solution, which is good enough so that I actually make progress as in I project out at least one coordinate. And then the other question is that once I did this, how can I get back uh, to a solution in the, um, 
original problem. So if I recurse on the smaller problem and projected out uh, uh, some variables and got a non-negative solution and the projected problem, how can I get back to, to an original solution? Now, if you just care about solving and don't care about running time, then you could just use all this method as an oracle, which gives you a yes or no answer to feasibility and just experiment deleting variables, but that would take a very long time. So what we can do is actually a compact, efficient way of answering all these questions. Now for that, let me just quickly define a basic operation, which is again, related to this uh, kappa condition number. So, so let me have a linear space and let J be the subspace uh, where let's say I, I projected down my problem to. So let's take any Y in this projection and let's take, uh, what does that mean that Y is in the projection? It means that there exists some vector X which uh, if I delete the coordinates in the subspace, which restricted to this uh, subset J gives exactly my vector Y. So here on the, the, the picture, like the, the, the blue bars give you such a solution. Now the lifting of Y to W is this LJW, which is the minimum norm vector in the subspace, which projects down to these coordinates. So typically you can have infinitely many, it's a, a whole uh, affine space you can have up there, which projects down here. Uh, and now I'm looking at a minimum norm point in this subspace, which I can compute efficiently with a projection matrix. And now what this kappa is telling us with pretty much exactly the same uh, proof I told you is that um, the infinity norm of this lifting will be at most kappa times the, the one norm of my coordinates in this restricted subspace. So anyways, um, what this lifting tells us, and uh, I'll uh, wrap up soon, but I just want to show you what the feasibility algorithm is doing. So I have a recursive algorithm, which takes in the black box, the, the newest, shiniest approximate LP solver, which, well, we do need some ugly technical work to convert it exactly to uh, the solution what we want. But what is the notable aspect here is that, well, uh, so I, I find a solution where the, for any epsilon, I can force the negative coordinates to be at most epsilon times the negative coordinates of D. And I can force a relaxed version of this proximity constraint I told you. And then uh, the feasibility problem, I also in the projected instance, I, I maintain a, an even further relaxed version of this proximity constraint, which will give us very nice extra powers to, to lift back these solutions. So then uh, basically maintaining this stronger form very nicely uh, resolves the questions I had. So I need to call the approximate solver with epsilon accuracy one over kappa times some polynomial of n and cube or something. And then I just look at j as the small coordinates. Uh, now, sorry, this j instead of nothing, it could be everything, which is the bad case. But luckily, we have a, a fix for this. We basically sometimes have to replace the vector d by its minimum norm projection to the subspace. So, th so that will be guaranteed. And then I recursively apply this feasibility algorithm on the projected problem. And then using the lift operation I just told you about, I lift back these coordinates uh, to the original space. And now using this bound on the lift operation, as well as the, um, uh, the, the proximity conditions I keep maintaining throughout, we can 
uh, the juice that this will be a non-negative vector and also satisfies what we need for proximity. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so uh, just, just a couple more words. So what I said, we would need n calls to the oracles. It, we can tweak it a bit to m calls to be enough. Uh, so, so then we, we get like this mn to the omega times log uh, kappa using the, 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 the latest deterministic solver. And again, just what I told you about this certification, um, we maintain we don't cannot compute this kappa, but we can maintain a guess on it. And then um, if any of these lifts, all these lifts uh, satisfy that they should with M instead of kappa, then rhythm succeeds. And, uh, but otherwise, from this lifting gone wrong, I can recover actual circle which has imbalance greater than my guess and, and then it gives me a very justified uh, reason to uh, increase my uh, guess and restart the algorithm. And I guess I'm not going to talk in any detail about optimization. So this feasibility is kind of the, the, the nice uh, simpler case. In optimization we have outer loops, inner loops or sort of perturb systems, but the, the game is again the same. We try to conclude that some variables must be positive in every optimal solution and project them out. It's just that we will need n times m calls instead of uh, just m calls. Um, and uh, let me just finish. Oh, right, yeah, almost, almost there. Uh, well, actually just a, a little side result, which we sometimes need and by itself, it it's, looks like a neat thing. So I told you about this Hoffman proximity theorem. We can, well, define it more generally with finding a point in a subspace with upper and lower bounds. And what we can get that if you have a feasible solution, then you can always convert it to a feasible solution also satisfying these proximity guarantees in a strongly polynomial time, which is kind of a, an interesting uh, algorithmic Kara uh, Theodori. Um, but yeah, so let me just finish with some open questions. Um, so for feasibility, we need M calls to the uh, approximate solver, but there is an asymmetry here between the primal and dual sides. Uh, uh, one is m and the other is n minus m in the dual that's necessarily much bigger. So, so ideally we, we'd hope to get the same, the minimum of m and n minus m for both. Um, and then optimization, well, has this extra overhead of n, uh, could, we, could we improve that? And if you look at some well-studied special cases such as max flows, these actually give way more re worse results than what our best strongly polynomial algorithms are, despite the fact that specifically for flows that the fast solvers have been massively improved lately. So can we somehow specialize this framework better for flows? And, and we have some ongoing work on this. Um, and then in, in general, a very interesting question is to explore further how far this kappa can be used, for example, in the context of nonlinear programs. And it's very related quantities play uh, important roles in integer programming. So, so we kind of uh, hope to explore it more. And uh, as I said, that's kind of my main message, this circuit imbalance measure is telling you something very fundamental about LP and linear spaces in general. And it's very you know, intimately connected to matroids, has very nice combinatorial properties. So I'm, I'm sure it will uh, come, uh, come handy in many other contexts as well. And uh, then I'm uh, finishing here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, that's a very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask or uh, write it into the chat.
Um, probably wait. Uh, can I just ask one question? So uh, I really like this uh, the notion of circuit imbalance, and especially the connection to matrix. Uh, so since this work, have you had any uh, further insights into other uh, structural properties of matrix and this idea of circuit imbalance? Yeah, so we, we were trying to look at uh, look at some connections to the matrix literature, but we haven't yet found any direct connections because there, like you normally we just work with the circuits as sets of factors and don't much care about the, the entries in them. Uh, one nice question, which as far as I knew is open, so if uh, you have a, a binary matroid, which is like defined by a totally unimodular matrix, then the circuit imbalance equals one. Is this if and only if? Like, could we have some, you know, other matroids which do not correspond to a TU matrix, but are linear matrix and this imbalance is also one or, uh, or, or is it like, I, I think if, 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 if someone is interested in, in this, it, it might be a, a nice uh, kind of uh, combinatorial question to look at and could give some, some more insights in this direction. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, it's okay. Accidentally. Um, I suppose not. So if you think of anything later, uh, feel free to write to Lancia. I'm sure you'd be happy to respond. Um, yeah, yeah. So just, uh, you know, send, drop me an email if you have any questions, or uh, I'm also happy to talk about this stuff. Um, 